an important aspect of our celebration today. We've um, put together, thanks to Steve, uh, some uh, pins that commemorate this occasion, and, and Eric Williams in particular. And what we've asked is, uh, what we'd like to do is to ask uh, Hilton White again to come forward so we can sort of officially bless them and then present them to uh, Erica and um, our panelists. Thanks. Yes, it is easier to bless living things, living people. And I'm sorry that the, the one who won this qualified to wear them is unavoidably absent. But um, we want to bless them, however. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, may anyone wearing any of these medals wear the medal with pride and total understanding that he who earned it and he who wore it at some time deserved it to the implicit value of being merited. We thank God for the privilege of doing this today. Amen. Hi, my name is Steve Dixon, and I'm one of the organizers of the symposium. Um, when the idea of the symposium came up, uh, one idea that I put forward was, or one idea that I raised was to strike a medal for the occasion. So we went ahead and we did that, and here they are now. And I would like to present this medal to Erica Williams, and uh, you know, I will kindly ask you to come up on stage Dr. Eric Williams, 1911 to 1981, Trinidad and Tobago, a scholar, politician, statesman. And on behalf of the Friends of Trinidad and Tobago, and on behalf of the Dixons, I'd like to present this medal to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we'd like to get started with our first panel. This panel is the Education and Scholarship Panel. The members of this panel are Dr. Clem London. Dr. London is, if you turn to your um, program, you'll see. Dr. London earned his teacher's diploma from the Government Training College in Trinidad, BA, and a master's degree in social science from educa in education at City College of the Univers City University of New York, and an educational degree in curriculum and instruction practices from Teachers College, Columbia University, in New York. Currently, he's my colleague and professor of education at Fordham University Graduate School of Education at the Lincoln Center campus. Dr. London has published several books, including Through Caribbean Eyes and Narratives on, on an Era of Independence, On Wings of Change, self, A Self-Portrait of a Developing Country, Parents and Schools, A Source Book, and Three Turtle Stories. And he's got a number of books in press, including poems about the Caribbean. Dr. London has traveled extensively throughout the Caribbean region and has presented scholarly papers in Barbados, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Martinique, Nassau, Puerto Rico, Trinidad, Guyana, the University of London, and at many universities across the United States. So it's a great pleasure that I introduce uh, one of the first panelists, Dr. Clement London. We also have with us um, Mr. Hilton White, who you met earlier and uh, who gave us the opening blessing. And we also have um, Dr. Selwyn Carrington. And Dr. Carrington is a senior lecturer in the Department of History at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, Trinidad, and associate professor of history at Howard University, Washington, D.C. for the academic year, 93-94, uh, or is it 94-95? 94-95. Dr. Carrington has published several works in the era of West Indian e economy at the end of the 18th century, including the British West Indies during the American Revo Revolution. Several of these are articles on the decline of the British West Indies and the abolition of the slave trade. He's presently working on a book entitled The Sugar Industry and the Abolition of the Slave Trade. It's my pleasure to introduce this panel 
will focus on, their comments will focus on the education aspects of the region. Dr. Clem London. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Charlene, for this invitation. Frankly, I find it is almost unconscionable that one should dare to speak on the educational impact of Dr. Eric Williams, a remarkable citizen of the world, a consummate scholar and humanist, in so short a spate of time as this program seeks to allow. Nonetheless, these constraints are academic, and I therefore trust that my colleagues here assembled this morning will grant me whatever unintended deviations and or encroachment of time as I try to speak to some salient issues in a rather superficial way. I must confess that I feel squelched, but so be it. It seems to me that any discourse on Dr. Eric Eustace Williams must of necessity confront the act of deciding where to begin and what to exclude. As a scholar, we see Williams the historian, Williams the economist, Williams a political theorist and a politician, Williams a social critic, Williams a philosopher, and Williams an educator. In essence, we see all of the above characteristics of a human being wrapped in a unitary package, representing a national, regional, and world symbol, as well as a student of world history. But above all, we see the facilitator, the teacher, the educator. There is a sense in which William's interest in and involvement with education lasted throughout his life. Indeed, his concerns were both theoretical and practical. Theoretically, his concerns are reflected in his scholarly writings on the subject matter, a matter that extended beyond three decades. Practically, we follow his consistent involvement in educational development in Trinidad, Tobago, the Caribbean, and abroad. In fact, because he has always acknowledged the supreme importance of education, his involvement assumed a local, regional, and universal ebullience in conversations, activities, and outreach. Eric Williams drew sustenance for his educational involvement and achievement from a very powerful and substantive philosophical knowledge base that is reflected in his tone Education in the British West Indies. In this volume, the manuscript of which was completed in 1946, but was not published until 1950 by the Teachers Economic and Cultural Association of Trinidad, a new edition was later issued by the University Place Bookshop, New York City, in 1968. And in this, William sets out many of his key educational positions. Among them, he used the metaphor and posited the view that the function of education should be that of a midwife to the emerging social order, instead of the chambermaid of the existing social order. Williams believed profoundly in the changes and transformation were critical to education. Hence, his enduring practical concern with his a main spheres of preoccupation, secondary education in Trinidad, university education in the Commonwealth Caribbean, and by implication, the, the impact of international outreach of these efforts. But here I must pause to take a hint from Erica Williams Connell, his daughter, who is loved and affectionately referred to us Trinbegonians as Erica, she gave us a rare peep into the inner workings of the humanity of our revered father of the nation by sharing in her interview with Ken Booby in 1986 
the import of his strategy. Retreat in order to advance, which he derived from a French proverb. And my ignorance of French does not permit me to give it to you, but I have it here. <laughs> I have a need here that we should take a retrospective walk and get some sense of William's formative years and the circumstances which led him on his long and arduous journey as a teacher educator. Dr. Eustace Williams was the quintessential educational leader who always was striving to educate a disenfranchised public, as well as to formulate new social, political, and economic policies for the developing new nation of Trinidad, Tobago. He was the first of 12 children and was born on September 25, 1911. So tomorrow is his birthday anniversary. He was born to Henry and Elisa Williams. What kind of place was Trinidad educationally then? In describing the era of his birth, Williams note that in 1911, Trinidad's trinity connoted the mundane rather than the religious. This was a government unrepresentative of the people and not responsible to it. An economy almost exclusively non-normative, non-native, in non-native hands, and a native population which were hewers of wood and drawers of water for its foreign overlords. In some ways, Williams discerned the parallels between his household and the colonies economic circumstances. Thus William begin, began his celebrated educational course from a definition of Trinidad, Tobago, and the Caribbean based on his philosophical and intellectual convictions, his practical experiences and political visions, the one informing and reinforcing the other. My friend shows me three. The apex of Williams's pre-university achievement was the winning of the most coveted island scholarship in October of 1931. This achievement launched him on a brilliant scholastic journey to Oxford University, the cradle of imperial education. The success of Eric Williams fulfilling his father's dream by winning this coveted scholarship led the scholar into close confrontation with his father and thereby initiated the first major decision of his life. It was his father wished that Eric should pursue the study of law or medicine, a profession which most parents in colonial Trinidad, Tobago, desired for their children. For not only would, it either, would either of these professions guarantee independence from the prevailing authoritarian political and economic system, but more significantly, each would ensure a measure of societal status most parents themselves were unable to achieve. However, much to the disappointment of his father, Eric declined to study law or medicine and instead chose a teaching profession. He studied modern history at Oxford University where prejudice was more of a challenge to him than his studies there. This decision to teach greatly influences career as an educator, a scholar, an emancipator, and a social reformer. In December 1938, Williams was awarded a doctor of philosophy degree with the dissertation being the economic aspect of the abolition of the West Indian slave trade and slavery. Most people, as Dr. Palmer pointed out, try to influence him into changing that title when he revised the manuscript for the book. But as part of his character and his conviction based on philosophical decision-making, he was adamant and kept to his purpose. I am really um, wondering now whether I should uh, proceed any further with this. I have not even gotten to the, quite yet to the meat of what I have to say. Uh, I have a, a fully written paper here. I, I, I made certain I didn't take it beyond 13 pages. I don't know why 13. <laughs> um, 
I hope that uh, there may be some mechanism by means of which this may be replicated and shared. But I talked about the possibility, the fact that Eric um, gave Trinidad Tobago free secondary education. And at the university or Caribbean level, he was very instrumental in expanding the university. The creation of the St. Augustine campus that saw uh, the introduction of new faculties, the change from the uh, having the expatriate run the university and changing that to Caribbean usage and occupation, uh, part of his legacy. Uh, I feel very constrained that I cannot give this to you in the details I would have liked to, um, bearing in mind that um, the purpose for which we are here. But I feel that his legacy is an enduring one. And um, long before we are gone, the spirit of Eric will live. Personally, uh, I have been influenced by Eric a great deal because he went to Toko in June 3, 1956. And that's where I'm from. You know, everybody else from Trinidad is from Port of Spain. I'm from Toko. <laughs> and he came to training, the training college, the government training college, in, um, in September of 1956, 54, when I was a student there, and invited us to come to his library. I was not politically oriented, and therefore I regret that I never did take him up on that, but some of my colleagues did. Finally, I want to say this, that when I came to New York, it was just before independence. And when I was ready to do my doctorate, at Columbia University, it was always in my mind that I wanted to go home and serve the nation. So I chose, by reading the draft plan, the 15-year draft plan, I read it from cover to cover, and I saw where the nation was going with education, and I chose to develop a comprehensive social studies for the junior secondary schools of Trinidad Tobago. They were not there yet. Not one was built. That's my, this is my document. A comprehensive curriculum. And the main focus was to promote nationalism. The use of the resources for nationhood. And after I was through with my degree, I went home four times, begging to be hired either at the ministry or at UWE. They didn't even answer my letters. They didn't deal with me. So I came back in frustration, one of 12 children like Eric, and I let down my bucket at Fordham University. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. London. And he only went four minutes over time. Um, and I'm also especially grateful that he is here at Fordham and has continued to teach the students at Fordham University and, and students in North America what life in the Caribbean and what the education, what riches we have in the Caribbean population. So in that sense, I'm grateful that he's here.